Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute and part of the Christians for Liberty Network. I am your host, Doug Stewart, and joined with me today is Corey Nathan, who is host of the podcast, Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. He's an investor, entrepreneur, and engaged citizen who loves to have productive dialogue about contentious topics and about religion and politics. Corey, thanks for joining me. It's great to be with you, Doug. I I really appreciate being included. Well, your interest in talking about contentious topics, if my mother met you on the street, she'd say, oh, you'd love to talk with my son, Doug, (laughs) because (laughs) he likes to talk about contentious topics. I think we're probably kindred spirits because also the without killing each other piece of the title of your podcast is also pretty important because important to me is that we have the ability to have civil dialogue. And even myself, I've had to rein myself in in a way because yes, I just, uh, I just got to, got I want to wring that person's neck for believing what they believe. And yeah. so we're starting this conversation off in January, 2024. So election year is up. Tensions are, is it's an election year. Tensions oh, are there, high. There's an election this year. I, yeah. I didn't right? know. Oh man. <laughs> I wish you were being truthful. Cause then I'd be like, that's awesome, man. I'm so glad you don't know this, but misinformation is going to be rampant and people's going to, they're going to be getting really high on tribalism. In churches, families, workplaces, people in those places are going to be at odds with one another or they're just going to have to like grit their teeth and ignore what everyone else is talking about just so that they don't get mad at each other. And so we're at a time where, and it's not like this is new. This happens every two years, every four years, whatever, where this kind of thing happens, but we need to learn to talk about it better. And so you're a good person to talk about this. Before we jump into like all the specifics, of like, hey, here's how to have really great conversations with people. Tell us a little bit about your story. You grew up as an observant Jew. Now you're a Christian. Give us a little background of that. Yeah, that background, my journey from growing up in a family that was going to synagogue every day. We kept kosher. We went to an Orthodox synagogue. And in my late 20s, becoming a Christian, in a lot of ways, led to this program, Talk Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other, because when I came to certain theological convictions about the messiahship of Yeshua ben Yosef, Jesus, I had to have very difficult conversations with my family, my dad in particular, about Uh why I came to this conclusion and what it meant for who I was as a Nathan in my family and our heritage. Those are difficult conversations, but also... I immediately started going to church once I became a Christian. And I very quickly, this is the early 2000s, I very quickly realized that a lot of folks I was going to church with weren't nearly as compelled by the Rabbi Jesus and his teachings and those theological convictions I had mentioned just a second ago. Their primary focus, it was a social and political disposition for them Mm. first. And in a tertiary way, they were Christians. That wasn't always the case. It's not to say that not everybody was taking their Bible seriously, but if they had a choice between bending scripture to make it sound like what they wanted to versus Mm -hmm. coming to the conclusion that their political preferences might've been wrong, they would choose their political preference every every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So to speak. (laughs) So all that to say, I was having some challenging conversations in my Bible studies with buddies from church, whether we were going out for a beer, you know, grabbing coffee together. So I realized that not only do we need to be having these conversations, we need to be doing it better in a more healthy Mm -hmm. way. And this is pre-Trump era. This is, like I said, going back to the early 2000s. So Yeah. I was watching a little bit of some of the interviews that you've done, and you had a guy call in he was really upset because you said something negative about Donald Trump and that, that triggered him, obviously. And one of the things that he mentioned was that God uses broken people to carry out his will or his plans or whatever. And it's almost as if, to your point about people twisting scripture or scriptural principles or Christian principles to fit their politics, it's like, well, oh yeah, God uses, you know, fallen and broken people to like carry out his plan. And it's like, well, that's true. That's a true statement. But it's like they've made that their reason 
It's like, well, this is how God works in the world is he uses people broken, terrible people with bad morals, just like Donald Trump. And that's what we're going <laughs> to, and it's like, wait, wait, no, no, no. You're missing the point that <laughs> right, God right. can use even the broken, the most broken of sinners. And I'm not necessarily saying that Donald Trump is there. He is in many ways. And so are others, obviously. But the point is that like, it's like, well, well, let's just bend it to justify why we really like Donald Trump. It's because, well, that's how God works. God works with these kinds of people. Um, no, God also uses righteous people to lead people to, to truth. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan. When it comes to scripture, I'm a big fan of reading as fully as possible and as contextually as possible. Yeah. And I'm not aware of what your audience's preferences might be or where their leanings might be. But when it comes to how I try to discern how to be in the world, including in politics, what my political activity is or how I vote or my civic engagement of any sort, I submit to the Bible, really. You know, And I don't want to use a word like literalist or authority. I take my Bible seriously. That's what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. read, I try to read every day, good chunks of it, not just a verse here and there. And I try to let it wash over me. And I also try to consider what I'm reading, again, contextually, and then from that derive, okay, so if I'm trying to make a decision, whether it's about an issue or a politician, I try to allow how the Bible has impacted me and what I'm reading in God's word mm -hmm. to affect that decision. And when I get hit over the head time and time and time again with something, I have to start to consider that. When it comes to Donald Trump, I'll just put it out there. I am not a fan. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Some of my friends say, oh, I, I like his policies. I just don't like his tweets or they try to oversimplify it that way. I just, I can't get around almost every page of the Bible just screams out to me against, it testifies against the words, actions, and character of Donald Trump. And we can get into it. But when it comes up again and again and again in scripture, I'm a conservative, a fiscal conservative, or actually a fiscal libertarian. Like, I joke around about being part of the leaf party as in leave me alone. So fiscally, <laughs> socially, I'm definitely socially libertarian, but I can't support someone who is the very, on the very opposite side of the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, general yeah. self-control. I can't get myself around a guy who is the very wrong side of the equation of love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. Yeah. Like yeah. again and again, you know what I mean? So take my Bible seriously and then try to derive what my activity in the civic space looks like because this is my authority, if you will. I think one of the challenges that a lot of Christians have, and whether it's a challenge, whether they realize it or not, is that you, you sit and read your scriptures, you read the Bible, you ask the Lord through the Spirit to kind of help you know how to live, right? And how to be obedient to Christ and to follow in the way. And you read things and you have to understand that sometimes what you're reading doesn't necessarily apply to something in your life in the way that you might think, right? So I'll give you an example. One would be, you know, reading reading the early church account of they, they held all things in common and no one needed anything. And Christians on the left will say, well, look, that's how we should be as a society. Well, okay, maybe, maybe that's a legit option or a legit interpretation, but it is not automatic that just because you read this and are like, this is how the Spirit's speaking to me, that like everybody else ought to be involved in your scheme of let's get people to look like the early church. And there are questions that we have to ask. So the, the method of applying scripture also matters as well. And so I think a lot of times we, we end up reading into scripture our preconceived ideas of how scripture ought to speak back to us, right? Yeah. And so more specifically, have you ever heard of the three languages of politics? No. Have you ever heard that concept? You might've heard of like Jonathan Haidt and he talk, sure. talks about in The Righteous Mind, he has the seven, um, I forget what the, not axes, but Arnold Kling, who I just recently had on the show, talks about the three languages of politics and he uses progressives, conservatives, and libertarians. Okay, so that's a very simple rubric to understand. And the, the progressives sure. and the Christian progressives and especially oppressor oppressed axis is how they think. If you're an oppressor or you're oppressed, you can be in these two camps. It's, it, is this law or is this policy an oppressive policy or does it liberate oppressed people, right? Conservatives think about this in terms of like civilization and barbarism. Libertarians think of it as liberty versus coercion. So you have these three axes. And if we approach the scripture 
as libertarians, we look at the scripture and we say, look, the Bible is talking about how we need to be free from coercion. And that is true. I'm not denying that at all, because obviously I'm a libertarian. And you'll see the progressives go to it and say, well, look, God is all about liberating the oppressed. You know, look at the story of Egypt. Look at the, the story of exile. Look at the story of like Jesus liberating us from the bondage of sin. And so there's that angle to it. And I think we all kind of speak our different languages. For you, now that I've kind of introduced that concept generally, when it comes to speaking to people necessarily without quote unquote killing each other, as the title of your podcast says, how do you tend to approach it when people just seem to be talking differently to one another and like sort of talking past one another? Because if you're speaking different languages, you're not going to understand. Yeah, it's a really important idea to explore and for each of us to think about. We all have a tendency to generalize and by generalizing, we will inevitably mischaracterize. And what I'm especially concerned about is by mischaracterizing, we vilify. I'll give you an example. The other night, I was talking to a really good friend of mine, really good friend. And I was talking about a school that my kids went to for about 10 years, and his kids are going to now. They are part of the classical Christian movement. Uh -huh. But there is a primary identifier, kind of what I described before, Every community night, they'll have a special speaker, and it's someone along the lines of Mark Levin or Ben Shapiro or Hugh yeah. Hewitt might have been one of the more moderate speakers. <laughs> and my thought to my buddy was, if they just owned it, if they just branded it, were classical Christian, American conservative or Trumpian yeah. or however yeah. they'd want to word it, I just wanted to be out there with it, as opposed to pretending that that's not who they are. And his response to me was very interesting well, what do you think about AOC? What about what Bernie Sanders has been saying now, trying to get through about Israel? And I said, hold on. First of all, you're not really asking me a question. Right. You're making a point in the disguise, in the costume of a question. Second of all, you're asking me a question assuming that I hold a certain position or that I espouse the virtues of the politics of the individuals that you just mentioned. I don't want to be backed into a corner of having to defend a position or a politician that right. ain't my cup yep. of tea. You yeah, know, you were, I, against, it was, was giving you a litmus test more so than just asking a question. It was more of an interrogation as a tactic in order to disqualify the point that I was trying yeah, to make yeah. about this school. So a lot of times you just have to, you have to recognize the contentiousness coming into it and then disarm the contentiousness so I have a lot of fertile soil to do that with my buddy because we have a relationship first, right? And I can also push back on him in a gentle, loving way, not by getting pulled into the contest and the debate and trying to win the debate, but by naming what it is that he's trying to do and then reframing our conversation by naming it so that we can explore something much more worthwhile. Like, hey, is this school really primarily, you know, a Fox Newsian, Rush Limbaughian, yeah, influence type of school? And if so, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Just own it. That that was the point. But any conversation you can enter into, there has to be almost the second eye that's watching for the weaponry that defines so many of these conversations. The yeah. whataboutisms, the generalization. What I was talking about before, generalization mischaracterization, vilification, and just the general contentiousness of it all. Like, I'm in a contest, I'm in a debate, I'm waiting to talk so I can throw out my rhetorical grenade and I can win the win this contest. Yeah, right, right. As opposed to like connecting in a relational way. So that it's not a transaction, it's a relational way. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think on the on the idea of naming naming it, what's happening in his question, you're identifying what he's doing, which is sort of a trick of language, a trick, not a trick in this, like a nefarious sense, but like, it's just a function of how we can use language to sort of get something across without actually coming out and saying it. And so when you name, hey, buddy, I can see what you're doing. And it doesn't seem like, like you could even challenge him more directly. It doesn't seem very honest to ask me this in this way. Or you could just say, hey, I see what you're doing. I understand what you're trying to get at with this question. But that's really not what's going on here. What's really going on here is we need to have a discussion about something a little bit broader and name the terms of the game that you're playing, whether it's a war or battle that you're engaged in, right? And so I think that is a 
it's an interesting way to disarm people and say, well, okay, now you're bringing things level. Because what it's what he's trying to do is level up, right? And be like, well, I'm going to say to you, hey, what do you think about so that I can find an easy way? Because the question was designed to be an easy way to keep you below him so that yeah. he can dominate the, in the conversation and to be able to sort of say, well, no, I, I call what you're doing, even if he doesn't even know it. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. Maybe he's just, that's what he's learned to do in conversation. And that's part of the problem that you're trying to solve for is being able to name the thing so that you're bringing to level and so that now you can talk. I think Alex Epstein calls this talking to zero or talking to 100. And it's like getting people to like a higher level of conversation. So it's interesting that your friend would sort of react to your suggestion that they need to either identify that they're not exactly just being classical liberal or whatever, that they're actually pretty just leaning to, in, to the conservative side. Do you think that part of that reaction is because people are somewhat afraid to hear challenging beliefs? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I should own up to the fact that if I was more Christ-like in the way that I engaged with him, because in a way I kind of did, I was contentious. There was a part of me, my ego really wanted to win this by redefining the rules, right? But if yeah. I was more Christ-like, I think that I might have responded in a more transcendent way and understood exactly what you're talking about. Put myself in his shoes and understand that he just heard something and his reaction is very similar to what my reaction might have been. Like, how can you think that? That's yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's and easy he, to do he, that, yeah. He articulates a question to push back on it because he has a visceral response to a notion that I just put out there, right? So if I can understand that's what he's reacting to in the moment and then do what Jesus so often did, which is respond to a question with another question, an identity level question. Why, why does that seem to bother you, buddy? Like, yeah. Or would it bother you if I did actually think that these people aren't idiots? Because he was mentioning AOC and it's easy for a person who's against her to call her an idiot or, you know, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Or, or there's a great question. John Rausch talks about this. Monty Guzman wrote an entire book about it. To ask a great question that allows the person to tap into story, their own story, right? And then we get away from even those, that trivium of labels, the conservative, libertarian, progressive. Yep. We get away from those labels and get into the humanity of the person that we're trying to connect with, right? Yeah. So the question would be something along the lines of, so tell me more about your life. Like, how did you arrive at these? You, you clearly feel strongly about this. Like, how did you arrive at that? Tell me about when you first started thinking about coming to these conclusions of being a strong conservative or more specifically, maybe not hating liberals or liberalism or leftism or however you might define it. Like, when did that start becoming a lot clearer to you? Tell me about, tell me about you, you know? Mm, and then that yeah. opens the person up to a story, their own story. And now I'm able to connect with them again, not on a, so that they're wearing a jersey and I know how to react based on that one data yeah. point. Oh, he watches Fox News or whatever it is. But I can respond to my friend who has a name, who has all of these complexities and nuances. And now we can really talk. Now we can really connect, you know? Corey, that takes too long and there's an election coming up. And so I have to win the <laughs> argument. I mean, right. I, you know, I say that in, in somewhat in jest, actually completely in jest, obviously. But yeah. there's an urgency that people seem to have that, you know, if Biden or Trump or whoever is next in office is the president, then the world is going to end. And so there's an urgency to it. Our friendship is not as important as the end of the world, right? Like, I realize yeah. nobody would articulate it. And, like, no friend would be like, hey, dude, I know you're my friend, but we're gonna have to put that aside. The end of the world is near. <laughs> no one's <laughs> rationally going to do that. But our survival instincts are going to be, no, my tribe is important. We need to be victorious over the powers of darkness, which you're, si which you're on the side of. That's kind of the mentality that a lot of people can tend to have. And so they see other people as a threat rather than just ideas that they falsely hold. Yeah. So quick story. I posted something about a year ago, actually. And it was really a question. It was a quandary. And that is, I don't understand folks who could never even conceive of the possibility of voting for someone with the wrong letter before their name. In other words, if you identify as a Republican, you can't even conceive of the possibility of voting for a Democrat and mm -hmm. vice versa. Somebody got back to me, a very public 
semi-public figure, a guy named Pete Dominic. He used to open up for The Daily Show and get the audience excited. He's a really accomplished stand-up. Now he has this great presence, stand-up with Pete Dominic. He got into politics on Poet on XM Radio. Pete and I have become friendly. Pete just pounded me online. And then a bunch of his listeners and followers started pounding me because he thought, I don't know what he thought I was saying or who I was referring to specifically. The funny thing is I was really trying to give a little crap to my pastor because he could never even imagine the possibility of voting for a Democrat. And Pete took it as, no, this is not the time to vote for Republicans. The Republican Party is too far gone. And I just said, Pete, we got to go offline. We got to have a conversation about this. I feel like there's a dog pile on the rabbit and I'm the rabbit. Yeah. Online. So Pete and I talked and he ended up coming on my, we recorded the conversation. I ended up sharing it. Pete continued to pound me. There's one particular politician, local politician, a woman named Suzette Valderas, who's running for state senator to replace Scott Wilk, a really effective state senator. In California legislature, Republicans have very little chance. But if they are bridge builders, and in Suzette's case, when she was in the assembly, she started the Problem Solvers Caucus in the state legislature. So I'm a big fan. We disagree on certain policies that she supports, legislation that she voted for, but there's some other things that we're really overlap, but mostly she's about problem solving. And she, and most importantly, in today's Republican Party, she doesn't see her Democratic colleagues as the enemy. She sees them as the loyal opposition, which I think is a really important framework. So Pete and I had this conversation. He's like, you can't, she's terrible for this and she's terrible on that and she's going to kill people and get, you know. And I said, <laughs> Pete, you just convinced me, you absolutely positively convinced me not of what you wanted to convince me of, but I'm going to now start supporting Suzette's campaign for state Senate even more vigorously, financially, and any platform I can give her. And that is often what happens. Sorry about the longer story than I planned, but- No, it's fine. That's often what happens. We can pound somebody, pound away at somebody, and what we're doing is just exactly the opposite. So contrast that with what I have found to be effective Instead of the transactional winning a debate and fighting and pounding away at somebody until they mm -hmm. submit and say, you're right, I'm going to vote the way you want me to vote. That never, ever, ever, ever happens. What does happen is when you read, and I've used this kind of comparison a couple of times already in this conversation, but when you redefine instead of a transactional interaction, a relational interaction, and you relate to someone on a human level, then you have a much better chance of persuading if that's what your objective is. But here's the other, the other caveat. You have an even greater chance of persuading if you leave room for the possibility of being persuaded. If you have the posture of, like Monty Guzman's book is titled, I Never Thought of It That Way. If you have a posture entering into a conversation, leaving room for the possibility that at some point you'll say, huh, I never thought of it that way. Ironically, that makes you a much more persuasive interlocutor, you mm -hmm. know? So that's what I try to do. And I also try to keep it in perspective. That is, I can get incredibly frustrated. How could people possibly think this way? As a Christian, we see folks that claim the title evangelical, and we know they've never cracked open the Bible. They don't go to church. These, these are political evangelicals. And that's crazy. I wish I could stunt my fingers and convince them all that they're completely wrong and maybe start going to church and taking their Bible more seriously. That's never going to happen. But what can happen is, and I'll, I'll close my point because uh, I've been rattling on a bit here. It's all good. But what can happen is I can have that influence I was talking about or that persuasiveness, possibility of persuasion with one person by one degree in one conversation. And that, that actually does change the world. Yeah. If we keep it in perspective that way. So. No, I mean, I appreciate that. And I think that is, I want to say, unfortunately, fortunately, on the one hand, it's, I should say it's fortunate on the one hand, because like there is a way for us to actually affect change. And then that's to have these kinds of conversations, unfortunately, because it's like a one at a time situation, or maybe in small groups, you know, if you're in Bible study and, you know, you have a little bit of an audience that is a, a unique or an intimate group of friends, you, you might have that, but it does seem like this is going to take a long time, right? <laughs> and, you know, there are, like I said, we have an election year coming. We have to convince as many people as possible right now. I want to shift to one particular topic, sure. which is, you know, everybody agrees on. And it's not very contentious. So I'm going to throw you a softball question here. How do you talk with people about the Israel-Palestine conflict? Okay. Yeah, you're right. So growing up Jewish, I have family. I have a lot of family in Israel. 
it depends on the person and it takes a great deal of restraint on my part in order to have an effective conversation. And frankly, sometimes I lose it. Like yeah. there was a gathering in my town at the city hall of Jewish folks and friends of Jewish folks the Wednesday after October 7th. They were just there to mourn together, to pray together for those who wanted to pray, just to be together and provide some comfort to those of us who are worrying about our family. At the same time, there were several trucks that were circling in the parking lot, waving Palestinian flags, shouting things such as from the river to the sea. And uh, there was definitely the, in the air, the smell of violence. It didn't break out, but um, that was a moment, and I've been in other situations where that possibility existed, that tension was there. That was a, a moment when I really had to restrain myself. Mm. But it really depends on the person and, and where they stand. I have a very, very, very dear friend who's done a great deal of work. She has an organization called Freedom Road. Her name's Lisa Sharon Harper. And a lot of folks would just put the label of diversity, equity, inclusion, or something yeah, along I know those who she lines. Is. Or, I've had conversations with her before. She's an incredible person. To her credit, I think putting the DEI label on her is kind of like the woke label. It's like, it's a way to, again, demonize in order to disqualify. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's unfair to the human being that I know, the, the wonderful leader, the thoughtful, sensitive person that I know, that's Lisa Sharon Harper. To her credit, she was the first one, or she was one of the first people that when we talked, she and I see it through a different lens. I think she has a great deal of empathy, specifically for Palestinian citizens. So she's been very vocal in support of Palestinian, I should say, civilians. So she's been very vocal, and that's where a lot of her efforts have been in providing a voice for and calling for the protection of Palestinian citizens. Mm -hmm. So what I was going to say is she was one of the first people, she knows I'm Jewish, and she knows I have family in Israel, to just check in. How you doing, buddy? How you doing, friend? You okay? And we had this wonderful conversation where she just asked me questions. Why do you think... I, I, I said, listen, she wasn't using the oppressed oppressor framework in her language, at least up to that point that I'd seen. But she said, why, why does that framework bother you? And I said, because if you knew my uncle Saul and my uncle Strulik, who arrived in what's now called Israel right after World War I, you would never dare call them colonizers. They were paupers. They were peasants that, yeah. that had to flee Cherniostra for Ukraine, where our family had been for 800 to 1,000 years. These do not colonizers make people who had to flee the Bolsheviks who were hunting Shrulik and the Cossacks who were burning down our houses, they had to flee with only what they could carry in their pockets. These are not colonizers. So I object to the oppressed oppressor framework in the first place. The point is, in that conversation with Lisa, she was wise enough and patient enough with me just to simply ask me questions, right? The other side of it is I had a conversation with someone. He is a big Trump fan, got a big old gun rack in his garage with mega stickers all over it. And he and I are good buddies too. And he checked in and he said, I thought it was just the wrong. It was almost as if he was doing a victory dance, like a touchdown dance. And it wasn't even a week or two weeks later, Max, when he checked in with me, he said, you know, if Trump was still in office, this never would have happened. And my first response was, <laughs> dude, forgive me if I'm hesitant to embrace the guy who bear hugs the Jews will not replace us people. Forgive me if I'm not really enthusiastic about the dude who has dinner with neo-Nazis. Like, sorry, like, yeah, he moved the thing to, from Tel Aviv to Yerushalayim. Like, okay, great. I don't know. That, that is not a sign of the, the next coming of Mashiach. Like, sorry, I, I can't do it. But more importantly, and he took it a step further and he said, well, so how do you like it now that your people, Ilhan Omar, is really, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, do you know me? Like, your people, hi, my like, name's Corey Nathan. <laughs> you know, like, I, ha have we met? Like, we've had extensive conversations about what my politics are and what my theological disposition is. He's got you in a box, apparently. Why? Because there's one thing, I'm one step outside of the pure MAGA movement in his eyes that he's very enthusiastic, and he has a right to be. But if I am not orthodox to that particular movement, that all of a sudden 
I am by default Ilhan Omar. Like, so that was really, really that, upsetting. That's a pretty big leap. Yeah. Yeah. So I had two very different conversations. I'm not trying to turn one into an angel and one into a devil necessarily. Sure, no, but those I, are two very different conversations. One was defined by generalizing and mischaracterizing. And one was defined by how you doing, buddy? And regardless yeah. of what Lisa's politics are, if she was a conservative that was supportive of Trump and that was the conversation, I'd be much more enthusiastic and encouraged by that. So, yeah. Yeah. It's a really tough thing to deal with an issue that is so hot and contentious in a way that you want to feel like you're getting all the right information and all the right facts. And you also want to pair that with having a, hey, how are you doing? How's your family kind of conversation, right? Because I think part of that is it disarms us from being so aggressive. Like, I don't know, maybe, of course, your friend who was a little bit, your MAGA 2A friend was probably a little bit more like, hey, I wouldn't have to apologize for you family being in this situation if my guy had won. So, okay, fine. But like to humanize your experience and to for you to talk about your uncle and your grandparent, your family who emigrated there right after World War II as non-colonizers, like, look, you really have to think about this from the Jewish perspective as well, right? Yeah. And, and there's not a, there's not only a binary to discuss. And by yeah. disarming people, by talking about the stories, that's like a really good way to do it. Right. And it's a really appropriate way. It also keeps it, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it no. does keep it on the lines of like, it's actually harder work. And maybe that's why it's better. Right. Like it's more effort to wait it out a little bit and hear the story and save your yeah buts for this other thing. As we wrap up, I just want to share, since we're talking about Israel Palestine a little bit here, one thing that I have decided to, or at least try to do in studying and understanding what's happening there and sort of even the history of the conflict is I'm pretty sure I won't read a lot of people and I haven't read it yet, but I won't read books and I won't read a ton of articles that are decidedly the Jews are evil or Palestine is lying to you, right? Like if it's going to be, I'm wanting to listen to people who say, I have opinions on this, but it's complicated and I can have empathy yeah. for both sides. Oh, yeah. Which means they're not dedicated to the rubric of oppressor oppressed, which is kind of the way most people see Israel Palestine. Or for that, actually, that's not true. People like Ben Shapiro would see this from the civilization barbarism mindset, right? Like the barbarians are literally, you know, at our gates and they've infiltrated our gates and now we got to go overtake their land for the sake of civilization, right? Okay, fine. Maybe that's true. Maybe not. Maybe that's just how you see it. <laughs> but it's not, <laughs> it's not that clear in all cases that you shouldn't have empathy on both sides and in particular. So, you know, I think in this conversation that we've had, we've come to, you know, uh, talk a lot about how relationships with people who have converse and to have conversations with them about their experience, about their, even how they come to know and believe what they believe. Yeah. You can't argue with how they came to believe. You can argue with what they believe. But you can't argue with their story of their investigation of a particular issue and what they learned and all of that. You, you can challenge what they learned, but not them, right? And so even that brings it down to the disarming level of, hey, we're friends trying to have a conversation here. So, yeah. I don't know if you have There's, any further um, thoughts on that. I do. There's a story, a type of a story in the, that's repeated in the Bible again and again and again. And it is, you look at, say, the book of Daniel, and there's Nebuchadnezzar, and he's the king of this great empire, right? And throughout the Bible, whether it's the Romans of later on or the Persians, there's great empire. And then there are prophets or heroic figures that we look at as people who you could say were really were oppressed, you know, at different points in the story. And who's still around? The Daniels, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are still around, right? But the Babylonians and the Persians, those empires from the Bible are not still around. So what, it, what does that tell me? It tells me that the desire to be an empire and to beat down other empires around us maybe isn't the best solution, but perhaps as a, my cousin was a, a civil engineer and I had seen a story. It was funny because I saw a very similar story to this on CBS Sunday morning a few months ago. And she connected with a, pal a 
happened to be an Israeli citizen who is Palestinian, Muslim Palestinian. They were building a new, not a settlement, but like a new community. And they had to collaborate across the different communities. There was like a Palestinian neighborhood, a primarily Jewish neighborhood, but they had to collaborate on the sewage system. And she became really good friends with this person. And she said, you know, whatever differences our people have, we had to get past it in order to figure our crap out. <laughs> Literally, we had to figure out our crap. Nice. And they connected. I think that's the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Conversations and connections like that, where they had a shared objective to figure out what to do with their crap, literally, versus I'm going to dominate you. Mm. You know, every time you try to squash someone by domination, you create 10 other extremists. So I don't know, maybe I'm drawing too much of a, it's too much of a stretch to make that comparison, but that's what I see. That's what I see the connection and the relationships of human beings. We could figure this out regardless of how I might vote, who I might vote for or what my spiritual beliefs are, we could figure it out if we're connecting on a human level as opposed to me trying to dominate you. Well, that's a great way to end. Corey, where can people find your podcast and where can they find you online if they want to hear more from you? Oh, I appreciate that. Really easy way to find the show is just politicsandreligion.us. That's our website. The end is spelled out www.politicsandreligion.us. Or you can find me on all the socials. I'm not really on Twitter anymore, but threads and Instagram at Corey S. Nathan. So at C-O-R-E-Y, S is a Sam, N-A-T-H-A-N, at Corey S. Nathan. All right, man. Well, thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. Doug, this is a real pleasure, man. I, again, I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. Hello, everyone. It's Doug from the Libertarian Christian Podcast. You might notice already that this recording sounds quite a bit different from usual. In fact, it probably sounds pretty crappy. Well, I'm doing this to show you something pretty amazing. As you might know, the guys over at Podsworth Media have been producing my show for several years, quite a while, hundreds of episodes. And now they have a brand new online app for taking rough recordings like this one and making them sound a whole lot cleaner and a lot more listenable in just a few easy clicks. So here are some of the core features. They remove background noise. It reduces plosives, which is really handy for me because I often forget to put my pop filter on before I do a YouTube video. I often forget to put my pop filter on before I do a YouTube video because pop filters look terrible when you're on camera. It fixes clipping. It removes clicks and pops. It fixes clipping. It removes clicks and pops. It evenly levels dialogue so that you don't have somebody talking really quietly. And then somebody talking really loud because they're too close to the mic or too far away from the mic. It evenly levels dialogue so that you don't have somebody talking really quietly. And then somebody talking really loud because they're too close to the mic or too far away from the mic. How do you use it? It's easy. You go to podsworth.com, you click get started. And because you're a listener to one of the Libertarian Christian Institute's podcasts, you can get 50% off your first order by entering the promo code LCI50. That's LCI50 and you will get 50% off your first order. If you are doing anything like a podcast, a video, a sermon, an audiobook, anything that's spoken word, you want to use podsworth.com and clean up your audio to be even more professional and polished. You want to use podsworth.com.